Hi there. In today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion about the Meiji era and focus on one area of popular culture which you may be familiar with, the idea of Japanese manga or comic books. Now, there are people who will tell you that manga begins a thousand years ago and has all these ancient roots. Well, that's really a distortion of the fact. Manga is a product of the Meiji era and kind of a fusion of this sort of newly understood comics from the Western tradition and a kind of reinvention of Japanese aesthetics. So to talk about this, we'll go back and look at some of the changes that were happening during the Meiji era with popular tastes. To begin with, in the early Meiji era, there was this tremendous fascination with all things Western. And there were Western-style magazines and Western-style publications and illustrations. And these were really drowning out any interest or desire for traditional aesthetic ideas. Slowly, there were things that were seen in the West which were imitations of Japanese ideas. It seemed to think that it was possible to reintroduce some Japanese aesthetic ideas into this modern media. Fujishima Takeji was uh, one of these artists who began to sort of borrow from the characteristics of Western Japanese, that sort of characteristics of Japanese style uh, art that had been popular in Europe, and sort of reintroduced them into Japan in this new modern way. Simplified, bolder colors, more obviously a kind of folk idea of the traditional past, much cruder. But you also notice a greater attention to realism. The treatment of the face and the hands uh, is much more realistic and contemporary, whereas there's a kind of cruder and more rudimentary sort of stenciling that's used in this image to give it a sense of a kind of folk tradition that was sort of being reinvented. Yumeji Takahisha was another illustrator who further popularized this idea, drawing from some of the sort of flatness and decorative qualities, uh, stretching and elongating the figure in this kind of new Art Deco sort of manner. And this started to reintroduce these uh, basic vocabulary for Japanese designs and Japanese illustrations that would feel more closer to traditional culture. As I mentioned before, the first introduction of Western style comics comes from a man by a British man by the name of Charles Wigman, who arrived in Japan as a a reporter for a British publication. He absolutely loved Japan, sent a letter back to his publisher in Britain and said, I'm quit. I want to live in Japan. And he just made his own magazine. He sort of invented a job. He created the Japan Punch based on a British publication, the Punch. And in this new, he magazine, he created these humorous illustrations, caricatures of Western expats in Japan, and some of the funny things he saw the locals doing as they were trying to learn some of the Western ways. And so these new Western style illustrations proved very popular. And for a long time, all comics in Japan were called punchi, punch pictures, based on the creations of Charles Wickman. It's not until the 1920s when an artist by the name of Rakuten Kitazawa uh, began to sort of fuse some of that new aesthetic with uh, Japanese tastes with the British idea of humor magazines. In it, he's now going to create a really interesting, more brush strokes, uh, you know, faster, looser kind of drawing that invokes 
this sense of kind of speed and graphic qualities of traditional Japanese art. He's going to be the one who really coins the word manga and not use the word panchii that everyone else had been using. Now, the word manga does have a bit of an older pedigree, as we know that it was Hokusai in his collection of illustrations. He called them manga, and he was referring to manga as this word that meant sort of loose sketches or breezy sorts of illustrations. And so Rakuten Kitazawa uses Hokusai idea of the word manga to create this new, faster, looser, simpler illustration, not all that cross-hatching that had been so commonly seen in Western-style illustrations. Take a look at Tonda Hanako from 1928. Now, my version of this comic actually I uh, found uh, is an Italian translation of the comic. And in this panel here, number five, we see the kid Hanako showing to her auntie and her uncle this new fangled Western dance she's learned called the Charleston. And what's interesting here in this panel is we see all these Japanese characters as she's doing this dance. Now, this is not her talking. This is actually the sound of her feet tapping. So even though every other panel on this comic is translated in Italian, this one panel, there is no way to really translate it because it's not actually words. It's sounds. And this is the other thing that really speaks to a kind of Japanese aesthetic, this faster movement, but also this vocalization of sounds and in terms of action and accentuating action through sound. Now, Japan is militarizing, and as it's militarizing, censorship grows more and more extreme. Um, and as these new laws are put in place, newspapers are finding it harder and harder to publish anything. Illustrated cartoons or political nature cartoons were forbidden, and soon all paper distribution was put under direct government control. So that if you crossed the government, you just didn't have anything to print on. And so comics books are banned eventually in 1944, and in this fallout, very few publications that were, were done at all during the war. There's a huge drought of this. So they had massive address, arrests. A lot of the socialists and the communists were put in prison or uh, shut down and silenced in many other ways. And we had this new way of reading, which was through these rental bookstores, Kashihonya, this way in which people could go to a store instead of buying the magazine outright, they would have it for a week and then return it. And this became the way that most people got access to um, news and events and popular reading. Japan is a very literate society, and so this need for information, this need for entertainment, was spilled out into a, an older traditional form of entertainment called kamishibai. Now, kamishibai is a very interesting tradition that has long roots in this barakumin, these performers who were sort of the outside, most marginalized of people in Japan. And they uh, were the people who really took on this very important role during the war years to sort of pass word and tell stories, entertain people with this kind of what's called picture recitation. Now, the performer, the kamishibai performer, would come on his bicycle to a park or public space, and he would flip up this little uh, picture frame, and he would insert a stack of pictures. And in it, he would pull out one picture at a time, and start to tell the story. And people would come around and hear stories of current events or what have you, or in many cases, these sort of exciting adventure stories were the way these things. Now, professional artists would make these sets of pictures, 
and then they would rent them out to the kamishibai performers who then make their money by selling small candies and goodies at the end of their performance. Now, there are lots of really interesting things about kamishibai. Uh, it continued on for a while until the arrival of television, and then it just almost completely disappeared. There are a handful of kamishibai performers still performing today. One of the great popular uh, characters to emerge out of this time was Ogan Batu, the, the golden bat from 1931. Now, I'd love to talk about the Ogan Batu, who is this sort of superhero character with his red cape and this staff that he could pound on the ground to create earthquakes, and he's fighting the evil Nazo, perhaps a veiled reference to Nazis? Who knows? Anyways, the Golden Bat was the protector of small children, as we see here and he had the power to fly. The Golden Bat is seven years prior to Superman, so there's a really good argument for the Golden Bat being the first ever superhero. Now you might say, well, it's not really in a comic book per se, and that is true, but the Golden Bat did become a comic book superhero in manga, after the war, and many of the artists who were making these picture books would go into manga making later. The other thing that's really important to note about Kamishibai is that it was strongly influenced by cinema. There was a very burgeoning interest in cinema, and a lot of the artists were using cinematic qualities in their Kamishibai performances. World War II ends very suddenly in Japan on August 9th. A few days earlier, on August 6th, in Hiroshima, the atomic bomb was dropped, and a second one in Nagasaki. In the 15th of August, Japan surrenders. This building here from Hiroshima uh, still stands as a testament. It seems to have been ground zero of the atomic bomb. The only reason it was able to survive the blast was that it, people think the bomb was directly above this structure. And so the forces came straight down upon it, and thus it was able to survive. The crew dropped the bomb, uh, directly killing an estimated 80,000 people and completely destroying about 68% of the city's buildings. In the following months, an estimated 60,000 more people died from injuries or radiation poisoning. Since 1945, several thousand more Hibakusha have died of illnesses caused by the bomb. The atomic bomb was a horrific event, unique so far in human history, and its influence on post-war Japan is very telling. In many ways, because of the way we ended the war, and because of the way that the society responded to this, this event, there was a sense of victimization. And we can talk about this in many different ways. But essentially, what happened after the war, and this is an important distinction, the United States had war crimes tribunals, but the only dealt with crimes Japan had perpetrated against the United States. And so Japan's position in the rest of Asia has remained sort of unpersecuted. And so for this reason, many countries in Asia strongly resent the Japanese. And the Japanese, because they feel like they had this bomb dropped on them, that they paid for over and above any crimes that they may have committed during the war. And so there is this strange shock to the Japanese culture at this time. And the transformation of this is one that has many impact on the popular culture of today. Following the war, uh, there was a great deal of 
struggle and difficulty. Most of Japan had really been spared direct bombing. The cities were largely destroyed, but the infrastructure was still in place. And so Japan was able to ramp up and retool pretty quickly. And in this, there was a, a need for entertainment, but still not a lot of opportunities to create uh, entertainment for people in this time. Osama Tezuka was a remarkable upper middle class kid who grew up in the sort of sheltered area of a kind of resort town. And he took up the fantasy of becoming Japan's first great animator. He really wanted to be the Walt Disney of Japan. Now, his father was a doctor, and so they were well off, and he was, of course, because of this, he was felt obligated to go to medical school, which he did get a degree in medicine. And even though there was a huge demand for doctors in Japan at this time, and absolutely no demand, perhaps even the job of animator did not even exist in Japan at this time, he continued to make comics and continued to thrive and grow toward becoming a comic artist with this ambition of being an animator. He had published a number of small uh, manga comics, uh, but this his his real breakout hit was Shin Takurajima, which was this new treasure island, uh, this uh, adventure story of this young kid, and it was all about action and all about this sort of movement and energy and drive. It was meant to be like watching a movie on paper. And he uses this sort of kamishibai sort of paper theater to really capture this idea of like the cinema and this sort of action, um, minimal dialogue, lots of sound effects. So you really felt this kind of immersive action. And this proved to be an absolute huge hit, selling over 400,000 copies. And suddenly publishers took notice that manga, this new genre of comic book, was now a big hit and everyone was jumping into it. And new illustrators who read this comic slavishly copied Osama Tezuka's style and technique to try and bring to life the kinds of stories that he thought would be popular to this new audience. Osama Tezuka created many, many memorable characters. I'm only going to refute to a few of the big ones that you may have be familiar with. For one, Astro Boy, as he is known in the United States, was created between 1952 and 1968, was supposed to be this atomic-powered little boy like Pinocchio, just wants to be a real boy, and he's a robot with these sort of human aspirations, and he gets into all these battles, and he gets into, he's very exciting, and because he was atomic-powered, the idea was that he was supposed to make atomic power less scary. Of course, they'd just been bombed um, and by atomic power, but it felt like atomic energy needed to be some part of modern Japan. So he takes this cause of this new robot to sort of make atomic energy seem more cuddly, more friendly. His next big hit was Jungle Taite, uh, or the Jungle Emperor. And this uh, as might look familiar to you. Uh, in certain Western uh, adaptations. It's a really an extraordinary story about this lion in Africa. And Osama Tezuka had been dis inspired by Walt Disney, as I had mentioned. And so he wanted to make a kind of Bambi story set in Africa. And he had this kid, and he's growing up, and there's these uh, evil uncle who is backed by hyenas, and then there are these you know, wilderness with insect-eating carnivores. And if this sounds at all familiar, it's because it is. It's very, very similar to The Lion King, put out by Disney two years after Osama Tezuka's death. <laughs> 
we'll talk more about that later. In the manga version, uh, there's a lot more about the relationship between the lion and human beings. Here, um, uh, the small boy, the, the lion, dies, sacrificing itself so the human can live, tricking it to kill him so he can survive a winter storm. But there are a lot of other similarities to the story. We see the jutting rock. We see the father in the clouds. And this was brought to the attention of Disney estate when they argued that they should recognize Asada Tezuka's contribution to the Lion King. Disney responded that they had never heard of Asama Tezuka or the Jungle Emperor. And to this day, Osama Tezuka has never been recognized for his contribution to Disney's work, even though Osama Tezuka, throughout his life, always credited Disney for his inspiration. Another really interesting point I wish to make here is that this idea of a white lion is may not entirely be, again, something that Osama Tezuka invented. There was an American comic from 1947, Jungle Comics, that featured a white lion called Simba. And this character is, again, a kind of avenging lion that's sort of attacking hunters and defending other creatures in the jungle. Now, we don't know exactly which American comics that Osama Tezuka had, but he clearly had bought a whole bunch of American comics from soldiers occupying, American soldiers occupying Japan. And this very comic may have been the actual origin of Osama Tezuka's ideas. Osama Tezuka continued to explore the idea of cinema in paper and produced a number of really stelling, stellar stories. Um, his most ambitious nine volumes, his longest continuous storyline of the life of Buddha. And you can see some really remarkable and innovative uh, compositions and ideas in his storytelling. It's a wonderful collection of stories that has been translated, and I highly recommend uh, you have a chance to read his epic series. Osama Tezuka continued to grow and mature his comics largely because he was forced to. He wanted to be and continue to push the boundaries of Japanese manga. He expanded on the vocabulary of girls' comics. He introduced the idea of more adult themes in comics. But adult themes in comics was something that other artists were trying to do, such as Yoshihiro Tatsumi, and they felt that the word manga just could not contain the idea of adult-themed comics because people kept thinking when they heard the word manga, they immediately thought they were talking about kids' manga. And there was beginning a kind of pushback against adult themes because people felt like, Kids coming to a shop to buy manga would see these adult-themed comics and were getting exposed to themes and ideas that were completely inappropriate for their age. So Yoshihiro Tatsuma came up with this idea of gekiga, which uh, translates as dramatic pictures, and they would adopt true-to-life stories or events about urban life. Here we see in this depiction of a janitor working in the sewer to clean up the garbage. He comes to work holding a bundle which he secretly drops in the sewer and it gets washed away. This bundle he is carrying is the aborted fetus of his girlfriend. And so this is a story about uh, not only just sort of the tough under guard of the, of the ground and the sewers. It's about the sort of urban issues and problems facing people in modern Japan.
Other stories that proved really compelling and powerful during the early years of Gekiga was Tetsuya Chiba's Tomorrow's Joe, a boxing story of extraordinary complexity and length uh, that had a real beginning, middle, and end. So unlike the sort of way in which American comics seem to constantly perpetuate their heroes over and over again. They die, but somehow, some way, or some manner, they come back. Um, this was not the case with Japanese manga. Japanese manga, the artist actually owns the characters. And so the artist is really in charge of the whole scope of the story. And they are much more prone to killing them off. In this scene here, much to the shock, Joe is in a battle with his chief rival and friend, and in this battle, he fouls his friend. You can see he's sort of hitting with the back of his hand. And this uh, makes a little tiny snapping sound as he breaks the neck of his opponent who falls to the ground dead. Joe wins the match, but he has killed his friend. And so this really striking moment in the story is just a way in which Japanese manga tells real stories with beginning, middle, and an end, with a great dramatic impetus. Another kind of stories that were very shocking were stories about the atomic bomb, uh, Barefoot Gen by Keiji Nakazawa, uh, was a story about a um, young boy who actually survived the dropping of the bomb and his experience and memories of the dropping of the bomb. He would go on to create this whole series called Barefoot Gen, sort of describes and looks at the issues surrounding the, 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 what, the militarism in Japan and uh, life during the war and the rebuilding after the dropping of the bomb. Another really extraordinary kind of manga emerges out of this sort of uh, is this more experimental avant-garde kind of manga. Tsugi Yoshiharo did not produce a lot of comics, but what he did was really groundbreaking and influential. This kind of absurdist drama of this kid wandering through this village where he's uh, cut himself um, or bit by a jellyfish and it's cut vain and he's struggling looking for a doctor and throughout this kind of wounded character with a sort of absurd condition is set in this sort of surreal world. You can see these pictures where he's wandering through this village. He gets on a train. The train has no train tracks. Uh, he or he, all he can find are eye doctors and eventually he meets this gynecologist and they play doctor and she repairs this vein that he's cut on his arm. Uh, it's this really sort of surreal sense of being a victim, uh, being wounded without really having a wound. It sort of characterizes post-war Japan and the sort of youth that are trying to come to terms with the history of the past. Now, if anyone talks to you about manga, perhaps one of the biggest things people immediately knows is the big eyes and the sort of prevailing cuteness of manga. And that, of course, is an undeniable feature of Japanese manga and Japan popular culture as a whole. Now, Hello Kitty really only comes out in the 1980s, and it is a take on actually a Scandinavian design. But these bulging eyes and this, this way in which the kind of expressionless generic face uh, is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's got a huge, huge following. And this initially comes out of the girls' comics. The idea of kawaii cute used to have a kind of saccharine sweetness to it. But during the emergence of girls' comics, um, as women began to make more of the girls' comics, the idea of being cute had a different uh, 
more generic quality to it, they began to shift the idea of being cute away from this sort of helplessness and, and into a kind of idea of, of cute being sort of being resourceful and having the ability to sort of take care of yourself. The idea was that uh, you were born beautiful, but you can sort of make yourself cute. And this sort of self-made girl who sort of had that ability to be cute was the real heroine of the story. And so we see cute as a kind of generic marker of self-sufficiency, but also a kind of idea that anything can be cute, uh, whereas only very few things can be beautiful. And that sense of everyone sort of this sort of middle class um, belonging to a kind of Japanese idea of self is really where it comes into having without any being a unique individual, you can still be very resourceful and cute. Cute has been played against and played off of in many different ways. I love this image uh, by Katsuhiro uh, Tomo, who uses this idea of cute with these kids who are really old at the same time and yet childish in this kind of scary way. Uh, his comic manga Akira is an absolute tour de force of sort of futurism that sort of draws from ideas of science fiction such as 2001 A Space Odyssey and this kind of punk culture that you might find in A Clockwork Orange. Here you see his you know, incredible illustrations of cities and technology, and sort of powerfully illustrated in a way that gives you the sense that you really are seeing the future. Of course, perhaps one of the most famous animators and contemporary artists in Japan today who's recently uh, gone into retirement is Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, there are a number of his absolutely uh, brilliant animations that have emerged, including My Neighbor Totoro, Princess Mononoke, and Howl's Moving Castle. What makes these stories so compelling is that he tells stories with really exceptional characters who are really struggling uh, with their identity and uh, their new roles in Howl's Moving Castle. We have a young girl who is cursed and suddenly finds herself to be an old woman. And at first, the struggles uh, and the frustrations uh, are, are kind of telling. But as she comes to terms with who she is as this older woman, she sort of likes herself uh, in this new role. But also what happens is she becomes younger again. This wonderful transformation that, you know, things that happen to us, and yet there's a kind of, again, cute-like resourcefulness that she is able to sort of reassert herself even despite being cursed.